Well, good morning, church. If we can all take our seats, uh, we'll be starting our service shortly. And we're late, and that's bad for us. We're late. But anyway, welcome new guests. And I believe there are a few people here that are here for the first time. If you would like to uh, stand up, um, introduce yourself, and let us know where you're from, you're welcome. You have the time right now. So anybody that would like to do that? And I'm sure we're going to have people leaving this week, so um, and during time of prayer, Pastor Al will remember to, to pray over safe travels to those that are leaving this week back up to the north. So, uh, ladies' breakfast will be happening this week, Tuesday, 9 a.m. at the El Dorado Hotel. Um, and the men's breakfast like always, is 10 a.m. Uh, on Fridays at the Red Lobster. 10 a.m. Friday, Red Lobster. All men are welcome. And then there's a wrap-up Bible study happening also at the El Dorado Hotel. Ooh, they're getting business from us twice this week. Hmm. 9 a.m. This is a Bible study wrap-up. Everybody is welcome. Not just those who have been attending in the class. Everybody is welcome. Okay. Um, Donna, could you just come up and just give us a bit of an update on the uh, on this CSC committee's work? Sure. Mm -hmm. Boy, we're, getting, we're getting smaller and smaller around here, aren't we? Well, I'm focus. Donna, and um, my husband and I are the coordinators for the dispensas within the uh, community services committee here at the church, which is involved in helping students and delivering food to needy people. Uh, today, I'm looking to speak with the, um, the summer church. We are looking for a summer dispenses coordinator. So anyone who's going to be here for the entire summer who would like to volunteer for that position, there won't be a whole lot that needs to be done, but it's definitely a necessity for this next season. So please either get a hold of me or Jim, and we'll go from there on that. And also we have envelopes at the back that are for the dispenses, and if you want to be a part of sharing uh, for people in need, uh, food, uh, it's got rice and beans and salt and all kinds of good things in there that every good uh, Mexican needs. Uh, I would appreciate it if you thought about giving a donation to that. Sorry, I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying that, but they love their rice, rice and beans. That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and just for your information, there's a hat rack mountain on the back wall there thanks to Rose and Wayne they have that rack available if you want to hang your hat while we're having a service uh, one more thing Easter Sunday is just, Easter Sunday is just around the corner it's in uh, two weeks time there has been a suggestion to have a church luncheon and we're trying to decide if it should be here or at a private home but first off we'd like to see a show of hands of how many people would be here for Easter Sunday service and who would like to attend that luncheon. So if you could just raise your hand. Can somebody do a quick count? Just stand up, Tanya. Do a quick count. So what would that be? Order in the back there, Jim, if you can 25. do 25. 25? Roughly 25? Okay, super. I will pass that information on. One more item. Uh, Sue has song sheets. If anybody needs a song sheet, those that can't see the screen, just put your hand up and Sue will help you out by giving you Okay, very good. Pastor El, if you want to start sure. the service then. Well, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you that we can meet together, worship you. Thank you that you accept our worship and our praise. Lord, may it be a sweet aroma to you. Thank you that we can come here. We have a place to worship beautiful place under Palapa. And Lord God, as we minister today and serve today and worship today, may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading is uh, from uh, Genesis. It's the story of Joseph. 
and we're going to be talking about uh, the suffering Christ and the suffering church today. And so all these passages uh, talk about uh, God's people that uh, from the very beginning have understood what suffering is and also we can see by these passages that God has provided a way to take away pain of his people, especially in suffering. So, Herman, go ahead. Good morning, church. Good to be back again. So, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot as a second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way. <coughs> Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath, Aenea, and gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, to be his wife. Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went up from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping record because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began. And just as Joseph had said, there was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told the Egyptians, Go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the world. Good morning, church. Would you stand with us as we worship? Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, because He deserves it, and He alone is worthy. Holy, 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 though the dark 
Heavenly Father, we uh, pray for people that are suffering. We just uh, would pray, Lord God, that uh, you would use us to help relieve the pain that's uh, throughout this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have our second reading now. It's from Psalm 22. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One, you are the praise of Israel. You, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and you they were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have seen my God, been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircled. Roaring lions, tearing their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh my strength, come quickly to me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise and the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. My comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. Thank you. Great passage that refers to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the suffering that he would go through uh, for us. 
in our time of community prayer. Uh, we're praying for a young guy, his name's Fernando. And uh, some of the men from our Friday men's group uh, took him down to Colima, I believe, uh, Thursday. I think it was Thursday, I'm not sure. Maybe it was Saturday. <laughs> but uh, they uh, have diagnosed, he's been deaf since birth. And he's 14 now. And uh, they've discovered that he's uh, uh, able to receive uh, cochlear implants. And which is quite exciting, especially when you've been deaf since birth. And so we're praying for him. His name's Fernando. And uh, we just are believing that uh, money will come in, that uh, this operation will happen. I guess we'll find out this week uh, kind of the progression of uh, where he stands in the system. And uh, anyway, keep Fernando on your in your prayers. I can't imagine being deaf myself for what it must be like to hear well. I, I shouldn't say I'm deaf. Maybe I'm not totally. My wife would disagree. I am deaf. <laughs> and also for people traveling. We're so excited. Our, a lot of our family are coming uh, today next Thursday, and then the following Tuesday. So we have kids, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and uh, Sue and I have rented another house so we can stay there. <laughs> I learned that from my dad. We'd have these great big Christmas reviews. And uh, we would all come and he'd make room for all of us at the house, sleeping bags and sofas, and, but mom and dad were not to be found. <laughs> we finally discovered they were uh, babysitting a neighbor's house that was gone to Florida, Florida for their winter. <laughs> so I learned that from my dad. But anyway, people traveling, and uh, they're safe. I would, one thing I always, I, I know all of you probably do too when you entertain guests, is I always pray for their good health, that they can enjoy it here. And terrible when they catch uh, bugs and different things coming down on the plane, and even when they're here eating foods that are different to them and drinking water that's unfamiliar to them. But it's important that we pray for their health while they visit that they can enjoy this beautiful country like we enjoy it. So let's pray. Maybe we'll pray silently. I think it's, uh, there's always things that are on our heart that uh, need to be uh, lifted up to God that are difficult to maybe stand up publicly and pray for. But God hears each and every prayer. So let's pray silently and then I'll close the prayer. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for listening. We just await your responses to each and every request. We just uh, pray for Fernando. Lord God, our prayer is that one day he'll hear. We pray for those traveling that you'll just watch over them. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. You can do it. We place our faith in it. In the name of Jesus we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven.
Thank you. Cher is going to give us uh, our last reading that comes from Romans. And it talks about uh, why we suffer, what we learn from it. Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. Thank you. Talking about suffering today and uh, Nobody's exempt from it. And if you are a Christian, you'll get your share of it. Guaranteed. But it's amazing we have a way to deal with it through Christ. And uh, we're going to look at that today. I want to read to you just, uh, Jesus talked about suffering. And it's uh, found in the book of Revelation. And it was uh, his letter to the church in Smyrna. And it goes like this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions, and I know your poverty yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. I like that. I like that Christ <laughs> understands that we do suffer and that we do face trials and tribulation that uh, we are persecuted. We're going to look at a uh, little bit of the persecuted church today. And uh, but the, the reason, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for everything under the sun. The suffering Christ and the suffering church. I would ask that someone would just stand up and pray for this time that we spent in the scriptures, anyone. Lord, may you give us the ears to hear and the wisdom to understand the words that you give to us. May you make us one people under God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. One thing that always helps me in kind of the beginning and understanding of suffering when we speak of Christ and his suffering and we speak of the world it's to look at those three crosses uh, it's interesting I, I can look at it because of this hat rack but but if you all want to turn around here and look at it they, the, the three crosses that were on the hill at Calvary and Jesus it says was on one of them and it says that there were two thieves one on the right and one on the left 
And so when we look at those three crosses, when we think about those three crosses, I think it was important, you know, even for me, that Christ didn't die alone. We know that. We absolutely know that. But there was a reason for those thieves that died alongside of him. And I think we learn from their conversation as this day progressed, as Jesus hung on the cross, suffered on the cross. And it said that the thieves hurled insults at him. But it's interesting, one thief, and, and what, this is what one thief said, and, it, and I think it helps us in understanding uh, punishment. One thief said, we, we're hanging here because of what we did. We're being punished for our actions. We deserve to die. But the one looked at Christ and said that he, he doesn't deserve to die. He doesn't deserve to die. He was suffering on our behalf. We, we know that. But he didn't deserve that suffering. He didn't deserve that crown of thorns. He didn't deserve to be mocked by the Roman soldiers that put a robe on him and paid homage to him, bowed before him. You know, king of the Jews. He didn't deserve that. He was being punished, but he didn't deserve the punishment. Jesus said in John 15, 18 to 20, he said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me. It hated me first. But he said, if you belong to the world, they'd love you. They'll love you as their own if you belong to the world. But I have chosen you, he said, out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not above or not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. First Peter 2.20 says, How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. I guess I always remember this when I used to get punished by my mother or father. And it's important that we learn the difference, that we learn to separate punishment from suffering. I'll, I can still picture my mom saying, this hurts me more than it does you. Hell no. Why did they say that? That wasn't true. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Maybe it was true. Maybe it was true because they taught us what was good and right to do. And they were the ones that had to punish us. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the time I got. I, I could remember and I could say, really? Why do you say that? Why? Wow. <laughs> uh, this hurts me more than it hurts me. God would say that. Oh, how it hurts God when he sees the spiritual life of someone die. 
his creation give up on him? God says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, the spiritual death of anyone. You go back to the cross and you look at the thief, the thieves there and the Jesus there, and you really have to say, I deserved it. I did deserve that punishment. But Jesus, you didn't. You were right, we were wrong. You see, that's the basis of our faith, is admitting to God that uh, we deserve punishment. And it's admitting, God, you're right. Forgive me. I remember going back to my mom and dad and after I became a Christian and saying to them, I am so sorry for what I've done. Sometimes parents don't deserve the deserve what they get from their children. But suffering as Christians is, uh, I looked just down, it's, uh, it's, it's different. It's not different in the effects of it, you know, it's painful, it's hurtful. As Christians it's unnecessary most of the time. It's needless, it's unwanted, it's not required, it's uncalled for, it's excessive, and just plain not fair. Just plain not fair. There used to be an advertisement in Canadian television for quite a while about, it was about a bath fitting thing. And after they got this new bathtub, this little kid knew that he was going to have to take a bath and said, it's just not fair. Why did you do that, mom and dad? Why did you put in a new bathtub? It's not fair. Not fair that I should be cleansed. Oh, yeah, it is. But the question is why? Cher read it. I think this is a good explanation of why. Uh, this verse always meant a lot to me because uh, I had a young native gal that was a cook in one of our camps, and she was going through a very difficult time in her life, and, and she, she said that it's not fair. Why, it's not fair that I deserve what I've been handed out, what's been given to me. It's not fair. She said, you're a preacher, you're a pastor. Tell me, help me. And I, I remember opening up the book in Romans and reading this to her, and I said, you know, first of all, you have to admit, you know, if it's your fault, it is fair. You're being punished. But if it's not your fault, it's not fair. And this is what the scripture says about it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know this is what we know about suffering as Christians. We know that suffering will produce perseverance, staying power, lasting power. And perseverance will, will turn into character, a character building of the Christian church and the Christian family of God. Our character is improved by our suffering. 
and character, that good character, will turn into hope. We won't lose hope. We'll just be strengthened by the hope. And it says, and the hope won't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That's why. Because it develops us as Christians. It builds our character. It causes us to be stronger. It causes us to endure the, the next dart that's thrown at us, so to speak. I'll never forget, we, Sue and I went on a trip one time and we got the neighbor lady to look after our kids. They were kids. They deserve punishment once in a while. We came back and I noticed in the basement wall there were little holes all over it. And I couldn't figure out what it was and I went up and I said, Phyllis, I said, what are the holes in the wall? And she said, well, one night I heard your one son say to your other son, duck sucker, and he was throwing darts at him. And I said, what did you do? She said, I just went in and drew that. <laughs> They're your kids, your problem. That's what the world does sometimes. When there's some, they just go and draw back. You worry about it, God. Well, believe me, God can deal with it. God can deal with every one of those dark holes. <laughs> I was thinking about suffering in the church and kind of enduring it and be and being stronger because of suffering and how that works and and I I I, I, I thought of my Boy Scout days and I thought you don't get a badge for this. You know there, there is no badge for suffering. You don't, you don't get a badge for enduring pain and hardship. But I do believe that suffering is the mark of Christians. It has been all through the ages. Especially when you look at martyrs and the suffering church. Because we believe and teach what Jesus taught taught us. He taught us the way and the truth and the life. And how that brings us to a restored relationship with a God that we disappointed. Standing up for what is right. <laughs> That's suffering sometimes, is standing up for what's right. We will suffer in our society today, believe me, if we stand up for what is right. If we stand up for what is right as far as the truth goes, even more so if you're a Christian. But this is what Jesus said in Isaiah, and I love this little one verse, Isaiah 63, 9. In all their distress, and all their suffering and all their pain, he too was distressed. He knows what's going on. <laughs> Sometimes we're like Peter, you know, and we, we kind of bow out, you know. Oh, Jesus, you'll never go to the cross, you'll never die. Peter. For the roaster, roaster, for the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. Oh no, Lord, I'll die with you. Cock a doodle doo. Cock a doodle doo. Cock a doodle doo. 
how many times, and it's so hard sometimes, when we're being attacked or we try to stand up to what is right, cock a doodle doo. Cock a doodle doo. I remember my wife in a little country store in Charlie Lake, and there are two thugs that were, I have to call them that thugs. Could have been the guy on the right and the guy on the left, I don't know. But there was a young girl there that was uh, the clerk in that store. She was about 14. She was, actually went to school with one of my sons. And I was with Sue, and we were getting a few things, and their language included every name in the book, and they let her know about it. Just very degrading gentleman. I remember my wife, she, uh, they were big guys too. I was big at the time, but they were bigger than me. Probably meaner. I remember my wife just walking right up to him and saying, that is not necessary. And I thought, oh boy, I need to leave. <laughs> Like, why did you put me in that position? I need to get out of here. Cock a doodle doo. Cock a doodle doo. It, it's difficult to stand up. But I, I think we need to do it more often than not. I know I've learned over the years that sometimes when we do stand up to what is wrong, there's usually a blessing that comes from it. You see, we are ministers of reconciliation. I think we always need to work to that end. I read a book, I just gave it to Cam this morning. It was, uh, it was a book called, uh, I think I wrote the name down. Through an Unknown Country, kind of an interesting title, eh? Through an Unknown Country. And just to explain it, because you won't understand what I'm about to say if I don't explain the book a little bit. But anyway, it was a book that was written in the late 1800s and early 1900s when they were first starting to survey and find passes for railways that crossed the breadth of Canada from the East Coast to the West Coast. And so this was a story actually about two surveyors that were surveying an optional pass to the one that went from Hinton through to Prince George, through what we know as uh, Jasper National Park. And so anyway, they, they took on this, these two engineers, young strapping guys. They left Prince George on December the 10th to find a pass through the Rockies to Edmonton. Well, you can imagine. They started out with about 20, 30 dogs, horses to begin with, but they had to take them back because they realized that when they feed for horses, And it was a story of suffering, and they had with them, they had a couple of native guides that uh, they didn't really know any, anything more than what the surveyors knew, but they knew the country, they knew the winter, they knew the elements. They were a great help in, in just being with this crew as they went through the Rockies. Well, it turned out it was... Uh, there was much suffering, much pain. It was a story of suffering and survival. They almost all died. But it was interesting, they asked one of these native boys, I think his name was Alex, and they said to him, they said, how are you doing? <laughs> when they were all around the campfire looking at their frozen fingers and feet. having to shoot their last couple of dogs that uh, 
this couldn't go on. They looked at this young native man and they said, how are you doing? <laughs> and he responded to them, cultus copa mica, cultus copa mica. And what that means in our language is, what's difficult for you is difficult for me. He was suffering too. I don't know why that kind of hits me. I guess it reminds me of God, you know, realizing that he knows what's difficult for us. And it's difficult for him too. It was actually a uh, That, that dialect is, is actually a Chinook Wawa dialect that was actually introduced when the, there was a lot of trade that was going on on the West Coast. So a lot of the tribes up and down that area knew that dialect. Cultus Copa Nika Copus. Cultus, not Copus. Cultus Copa. Mika, cultus culpa, Mika. What's hard for me is hard for you. I don't know. I don't know why I put that in. <laughs> At the restaurant the other day, it, it, I was waiting for the men's breakfast and I was all by myself and Lucy came over and she said, do you want to order? I don't know. Tal vez estoy solo. I think I'm alone. And then one guy walked in, and then another guy walked in, and she calls, no, so no. <laughs> You're not alone. I think we need to know that, that we're not alone in our suffering. I think we need to know that we're not alone in our persecution. Just one more thing, and then I'm going to close. And uh, that's just talking about, I think, on that that Norm put up, it, it's on the, about the Colosseum. Even though the architecture is unbelievable, I remember walking through it. But then I also remember reading a lot of the history of it and the persecution that took place there. Most of the persecution didn't take place in the Colosseum during the time of Nero. It actually, most of it took place outside the Colosseum because he had a statue there, and if you didn't bow down, if you were a Christian, and you didn't bow down and worship Nero, <laughs> you were punished. Martyred. Killed. Hung on a cross. Covered with tar, lit a fire. Persecution's always been around. In fact, they've, when you look at persecution, you look at martyrs, they've been God's voice throughout the ages from the time of the prophets, even when we read about Joseph this morning. The prophets and their suffering, Jesus said, you've killed the prophets. Everyone that came to tell you the good news, the truth. Even the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, cut his head off put it on a platter. You see, suffering isn't comfortable, but yet the scriptures speak of it that, that it happened. It did happen. Starting with Stephen in the book of Acts. But it happened for a reason. 
after the persecution of Stephen, the gospel spread throughout of all, all throughout Europe because it scattered the church. It got people out of that comfortable place that they were in. Suffering has a purpose, too. The persecuted church with a purpose in spreading the gospel throughout the world. Why the cross? Why Christ? A symbol of suffering and shame. Because there's hope there. There's forgiveness there. There's love there. There's strength there. Ah. <laughs> I worked on a couple ranches in Oregon in the 60s. Yeah. And they were both big, large cattle ranches. The first one I worked on was a, a big ranch. The guy ran a couple thousand head of cattle. Had a feedlot, too. And one year he decided that he was going to keep all of his heifers and breed them because he wanted to increase his herd. So he got a drug that we gave to all the heifers that caused them to all to cycle at the same time. And then he bought a whole truckload of bulls to take care of this problem. But I got to tell you, they all got bred, but they also all started calving at the same time. I was young and strong and we all took our turns and going out at night and we had problems. We had problems not only because there were so many of them at once, but we had problems because of the drug caused a lot of hormone problems in the heifers. We had a lot of deformed calves and just a lot of stuff that I hope I never see again. I never forget bringing a heifer in. That I remember my the owner of the ranch told me he had checked up until about midnight, and he told me he said, "Al, there was a little black heifer, <laughs> a little black heifer. There was 400 black heifers." <laughs> but it's funny how we'd figure that out. He said, "Anyway, a little black heifer overstanding in the by the creek in that corner of the pen." He said started to calve around 10 o'clock and she hadn't gotten anywhere, which is normal for a heifer. I said, you should check on her. So I, I found her, <laughs> a black heifer, in the midst of 400 black heifers, calving, hadn't calved yet. And this was like 4 o'clock in the morning and I thought, eh, it's been a long time, I better, nothing showing. I better take her in and check. So I walked her into the calving barn and got her in the squeeze chute and checked to see what was wrong. And of course, in doing that, you're right up to your elbow inside of a cow and yeah, not elbow, armpit. And I remember you always know you're in trouble when you first thing you touch is their tail. And the next thing you feel is their feet that are pointed straight up. You realize, okay, upside down and backwards. So I'm in there trying to help her. And I was just doing my best to move this calf around to get it turned around without breaking the umbilical cord and getting it turned around and twisted around and all of a sudden she started kicking me. <laughs> and I remember I couldn't do anything. I just was in there that far and she wham, 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 wham. She just started this kicking frenzy, kicked me in my knees and my chins and my ankles and, and I didn't want to let go. I was halfway done and I'm not saying I'm not gonna, and I remember, I remember this distinctly. And it was, it was in the spring of the year in February in Oregon. It's not quite that cold, not like Canada, but I remember 
that I remember laying my head on top of her back, on top of her hips, just to rest. And I, I remember that I remember her hair coat and it had little droplets of, of water because she was hot and had been trying to do this for a couple hours and I remember laying my head on her back with my arm up to my armpit inside of her and saying, don't kick me anymore. Quit kicking me. It hurts. And all I'm trying to do is help you. I'm just trying to help you. I sometimes think Jesus, when he looked out at the crowd and he suffered the I don't know why you're doing this, but I'm just trying to help you. And boy did he. Boy did he ever. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He did it for us. I wish the world would quit kicking it. Amen. We have another song to sing. Stand if you can. Sing. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
face shine upon you, all of you, and be gracious to you, each and every one of you. But most of all, may you feel the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you that good and that everlasting peace that only Jesus can give. God bless you. Have a good day, a good week. Hopefully we'll see some of you next week.